Hello and welcome to Unstress, where each week we take another look at what stresses us or those we love, or what stresses our one and only planet, and then try and look at things in a more holistic way. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. The subject of today's episode is children's health, and as I've said before, whether you've got children or not, this is relevant to everyone, because children are the most vulnerable in our society and really could or should be thought of as the canaries in the coal mine. What's happening to them may well be happening to you. It's just that you may have accepted that as your own normal an interesting idea, really. My guest today is Sydney-based holistic paediatrician, Dr. Deb Levy. Now, as you will hear, Dr. Deb has a great model for thinking about health and all its challenges. She calls it her five P's. Actually, later in the show, she adds an extra P, so really there's six. But anyway, Deb has been trained in South Africa, where she graduated from medicine with first-class honours then went on to study and practice paediatrics in the UK and in Australia. During her work as a paediatrician within the conventional hospital system, she witnessed firsthand what I think we should all be very alarmed about, and that is the rising incidence of illnesses in children like allergies, eczema, asthma, diabetes, obesity, as well as mood and mental health disorders. She was particularly alarmed at the prediction, that is, the generation, this generation of parents may outlive their children. That's a shocking statement to make, but that is what health trends are showing. Deb has two young children herself, so this isn't just of professional interest, but very personally concerned. She believes she needed to offer a more holistic approach to tackle these issues and with a particular interest in the role of diet, gut health and lifestyle. She's a strong advocate of food as medicine, the impact of the environment and mind-body practices. She takes a holistic integrative approach, which means combining the best of conventional medicine with an in-depth knowledge of nutrition, biology and science to create a safe treatment plan, to create safe treatment plans which may include both prescription medication or personalised health uh, lifestyle programs or both. Why not use the best of both worlds? Now that to me is truly holistic and that's integrating modern and complementary medicine and of course some good old common sense. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Deb Levy. Welcome to the show, Deb. Thank you, Ron. Great to be here. Deb, uh, you are a holistic paediatrician and integrative practitioner. I wondered if you could just share with our listener part of that journey that got you to this point. Absolutely. Um, so, Ron, I'm a conventionally trained paediatrician, as you mentioned, and um, I've worked many, many years in the hospital system. And um, I actually dual trained in paediatrics and paediatric emergency medicine. So um, I was at the front of things and you know, managing acutely unwanted, unwell children, leading resuscitations, um, you know, seeing lots and lots of very sick children. And during the time that, that I was working, I, I, I couldn't help but notice an increase in certain illnesses, your allergies, your asthma, um, your food intolerances. And, and I started to wonder, well, you know, there must be some other way or, you know, perhaps a better way that I can help children. Um, and then, and then I fell pregnant myself. Congratulations. <laughs> and, um, thank you. Um, I have two little kids now. And um, that deepened my, my journey because my husband had very, very bad, bad eczema when he was young and severe food allergies, and he's still anaphylactic to several foods. And, you know, from my, my reading and my study and, and all my learning, I knew that there was something that I could do, you know, to try and help my children not develop those same illnesses. So... I think, you know, a combination of both my professional and my personal experience really um, made me take a step a little bit in a different direction and, you know, not so much in the, the acute hospital medicine, but, but looking at illnesses more holistically, looking at the root causes and, and trying not only to better treat illnesses, but also to help prevent them and help our children thrive. 
Yeah, look, that that is quite a journey. And I mean, I think for our listener, it might be worth just kind of adding up the years there because, I mean, medicine is five to six years and then you go through your residency. Yep. And you know, just that, just give us a brief, you must have done this in your head many times. <laughs> Are you, are you trying to make me feel old, Ron? No, I'm not. No, hey, come on, Deb. You know. <laughs> I've no. got a few years um, on you. I know that. Um, so I worked with, you know, with children in the hospital system for around about 15 years, and, um, and that excludes my, my medical degree, mm. which was seven years and a couple of years before I got into my pediatric training. And then um, I'm... I've been in private practice now in the eastern suburbs of Sydney for the past seven years. Well, so um, yes, it's been a long journey, but uh, a fun one. Yes. Well, the reason I ask that is because my next—I mean, one of the things that I often get asked, and I have described myself as a holistic practitioner for many years—is what does holistic mean? So I'm always asking this question: What does it mean to you? What does holistic mean to you? To me, um, perhaps another way of answering that is: Well, how do I manage patients holistically? Mm-hmm. So. I work within a framework that I've developed that I've called, that I call my Happy Kids program, and um, I look at certain elements. And I've, you know, I'm a pediatrician. I think quite simply. So I talk about um, plate, play, pause, people, and protect. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Say yeah, that no again. Problem, place. Plate. Yeah. Plate, like your plate. Yep. And um, play. Yep. Pause. Yep. People. And protect. Great. So I'll go through those in a little bit of okay. detail. Yeah. So plate is about your nutrition and what you eat. You know, from from breastfeeding, actually, well, from preconception and during pregnancy for the mum, but essentially what the child's eating um, and how that influences your health. The next one is play. So that's lifestyle. That's being outdoors. That's activity levels. Pause is about relaxation, about sleep, about mindfulness. Um, all concepts that are obviously age dependent and variable, but um, wonderful skills to um, teach when children are young. Um, the next one, play to play, of course, people. So that's about relationships. Um, you know, relationships are so important for children, for their development, for their growth. And um, also, if you look at the literature, relationships and good relationships has been shown to actually increase your longevity. And when do you learn how to form attachments? Well, that's when you're young. So again, very important. And also important for mum and postnatal depression. So really that, that, that's quite a big bucket there. And the fifth one is protect. So protect is about being aware of what's normal and um, where your child should be and what their development should be. So protecting them um, from that perspective, but then also looking at their environment. So what toxins are there in their environment that can be playing um, a detrimental you know, impact on their health? So, you know, I look globally at the child. Um, I'll use an example. A child comes to see me, let's say perhaps with um, eczema or constipation, and um, it's not for me just about giving them that cream, giving them that laxative. It's about really looking at all of these aspects to try and work out, well, where have things gone wrong and what can we work on in order to improve their health? Wow, that that's brilliant. I love that. The five P's. <laughs> um, but but yeah. let's no, but it, uh, well, let's go back to nutrition because no, let's yes. take a step back for a moment because I'd love to get into this uh, this these five P's. But what are we seeing out there? What I mean, you're seeing kids now. Pediatricians treat to what age group? Well, I treat from zero to sixteen years. Yeah, and and in your years now, looking back over uh, people's uh, children's health, how are we doing? <clears throat> <laughs> um, we are not doing so great. <laughs> look, if, if you look at children's health, I guess the the most common illnesses that um, we're seeing now and certainly have been on the rise are your atopic conditions, your um, obesity, and um, mood disorders. So those would be my top three that um, certainly I've appreciated an increase in. With your atopic disorders here, I'm referring to eczema, um, asthma, food allergies, hay fever. Mm. And um, if you look at the statistics now, one in four children in Australia have asthma or eczema, and one in 10 have a serious food allergy. I mean, these are food allergies that could kill you if you don't have your adrenaline on you. So this is not a, a, you know, a small problem. Mm. That's hu- I mean, it's, it's huge. Ab- absolutely. Um, and 
if you look at what is actually going on, well, then you have to question, well, why is this happening? Hmm. And we cannot explain it by a shift in our genes. So we born with a set of genes and it takes hundreds of years for those genes to actually shift in terms of um, what those genes look like and what they express. But what we can um, explain is that why are certain genes being switched on and switched off? And this is the concept of epigenetics, which I suspect some of your listeners are familiar with. We are very and, familiar um, with that. Exactly. That's and um, this is trying to work out, well, why are certain genes switched on and switched off? So, you know, I'll, you know, use my personal example. Well, why are my children who, you know, really were a ticking time bomb for all these atopic conditions, why thankfully do neither of them have any of them? You know, so... Well, you studied I, I medicine that, for long enough. I well, mean. <laughs> I know. Exactly. They had the benefit of me. Not completely um, altruistic. No, no. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that really needs... That really begs for all of us to open our eyes and look at what we can do before children get illnesses as well as, um, you know, the chronic diseases associated with obesity. I haven't even t- spoken about that yet, but mm-hmm. um, that's obviously the next big group um, of, um, of children in terms of increasing disorders and diseases. I mean, you know, I've been involved with Mind, the Mind Foundation, which is very yes. focused on this. and. Their, st- yes. their statistics, which kind of uh, follow what you've just said, uh, are, are concerning, frightening. I mean, I think the you, you're going to get on to mood as well, which was your third mood disorder, because yes. that's go and talk to us a little. We'll, we'll get back. We've jumped ahead, but but go into the um, the mood disorders because that's quite disturbing too, isn't it? No, absolutely, and I, and I mean, I, I know that they're looking forward and they're predicting that it's going to be like one in thirty children or one in twenty-five children. I think they're predicting are going to um, have some form of either ADHD, you know, the attention deficit disorders, or a form of autism. And um, you know, again, we you cannot explain it any other way other than looking at lifestyle. You, we cannot explain it, and um, studies have have shown that it's not just because we're getting better at detecting these things and get getting better at diagnosing them. It is merely because it is becoming more common. Um, and it's going to not only burden our families, it's going to burden our communities and uh, our healthcare as well. So to me, it makes perfect sense to jump in now and, you know, try and work on all those factors that we can hopefully lessen. I mean, I, there is a genetic component. I don't want people not to be aware of that. And, you know, certainly things like autism does run in families. But, you know, let's, let's work out how we can help protect our children. Yes, because this concept, and, you know, I said uh, our audience is probably uh, familiar with epigenetics, but, but, but let's just uh, re- redefine that for our listener again, uh, the, the, the concept. Because one is genetic determinism. This is my family mm-hmm. history. This is what it is. Mm-hmm. And it will never be any different. But epigenetics takes a different stance. Can you just explain that to our listener? Yes, sure. Um, well, the, the way that I look at it is, you know, there, there are two types of genes that we have. Um, the one type is, you know, like you say, very in, in concrete, really stuck in concrete. So you're born with blue eyes or you're born with brown eyes. That's not going to change. But there's a whole host of genes that um, then develop into proteins and enzymes, et cetera. And those genes are either switched on or switched off. And we've been able to identify certain of those switches as such, um, but a lot of them we don't know. So it's it's about trying to work out, well, why are those genes being switched on and switched off and what can we do about it? Yeah. I, I mean, think that's probably I mean, the simplest way. I mean, there was always this, is it nature or nurture? And we exactly. always we always love to have the one answer, but what if it was both? It's both. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree with you, Ron. It's both. Yeah, so so these so mood disorders. Yeah, and then the last one you see, you mentioned atopic disorders, which are eczema, asthma, um, etc., and then mood disorders, ADHD, autism, which are, are pretty mm-hmm. frightening. Obesity. Mm-hmm. How are we doing there? <laughs> Look, not great. <laughs> no, I keep on feeling like I'm saying not great. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you do look at the statistics for you know children in Australia. Um, again, it's a one in four. So one in four children are either overweight or obese, and that's from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. <laughs> you know, so mm. if you look at that, I mean, that's to me, I, I think we're shifting towards, you know, the state of America. 
um, where the majority of children there are obese. And with obesity comes all the, pro the problems of chronic diseases. So obesity is linked to type 2 diabetes, to heart conditions, to strokes, to high blood pressure, to liver problems, joint problems. Never mind all the, the social implications for children being bullied or teased at school. Um, so I think that you... The, the implications of it is so huge for us not to tackle it now is, you know, very, um, very brave of us. Yeah. Um, it's not quite dangerous. Yeah. But how do we, yeah. how have we, uh, how have those statistics changed, say, diabetes? I've also heard cancer rates in kids are on the rise. Yes. Are, are they on the rise? Yes. They do. I'm sorry, I don't have a statistic at the top no. of my, you know, head That's for right. that one, Ron. But your, but, cl your experience, um, your clinical experience. Yes. Yes. Um, yes, they are on the rise. And, and um, I believe the literature around that is mainly looking at toxin exposure um, in terms of well, what's, you know, why those genes being switched on or switched off. And that seems to be around toxins, whether it's, you know, your endocrine disruptors or um, other toxins. So now, now that would be your environment. I, I want to just explore a little bit of those five Ps that you were talking about, but I also mm -hmm. just wanted to reflect back on all of your, you know, because you're saying basically that there are nutritional, environmental, and I love those people, relationships, pause, sleep, oh. rest, all that. But environmental and nutritional components are huge. In your uh, seven years of when you were studying for medicine and then your other years as a paediatrician and you're all that time in the hospital, how big a role did in nutritional and environmental issues play in your education? <laughs> um, you mean my personal? Not your. Sure. I know. I, I know. <laughs> yeah. I know you rose. Yeah. I know you rose um, look, above that. I know you. You yeah. recognise it. But in the in the traditional education, how big a part have, did these yeah. did these drivers play in in the in the education of doctors? Absolutely minimal. Uh, there is a little bit. I'm not going to say there's nothing, but um, an absolute minimum, which I which I think is why it makes it sometimes quite challenging for holistic practitioners to um, be able to get across their message because it is seen as so foreign and so new. Um, whereas I guess if you look at other healthcare providers like naturopaths or Ayurvedic practitioners, you know, they've been speaking about this for many, many, many years. But certainly uh, through the conventional training system, um, there is not a, a lot of information out there. Is that because the focus is just on management rather than cure? I, I think it's, I think there are probably a few aspects to it. I do think that there's definitely a drive to, um, you know, name it and, and treat it um, and, and not look at the root cause. And um, I think there's also the other aspect of wanting to practice evidence-based medicine, which I 100% support. And I think the difficulty comes with, especially with nutritional medicine, it can be very difficult to construct a um, very clear study. So, for example, if you are looking at what food a, you know, a child has eaten, it's often a, a history-based study where you're sitting with the parent and asking, well, what have they been eating for the last year? And, which is a really tough kind of study to do because there's a lot of bias in that. Um, you know, and also, if food as a total object is very different from giving actual nutrients. So I'm just touching on a few little mm. bit of as a few aspects of why it makes studies difficult. So yeah. I think that there are those two reasons. Yeah. So let's get back to your five Ps because I love it. Um, what are some of the things that, I mean, what are some of the nutrients that we should be, that are causing the problems and some that we should be focusing on? Um. I think it depends exactly what, what problem we're referring to. Um, I don't think in terms of general health, I can give you any, you know, two or three specific um, nutrients. Yep. I think if we're talking about specific conditions, I could. So okay, take, well, for example... Asthma? Yeah. What about asthma? I mean, people, one in four kids are suffering from asthma and a child comes in with asthma. What nutritionally would you, um, you know, be looking at? Okay, so for asthma and all your atopic conditions, um, the most studied nutrient will be vitamin D. And um, the Murdoch 
Institute done in Melbourne has certainly done a lot of research around that. And um, that's around the role that vitamin D plays in your immune system. So vitamin D would be one. Another one would be healthy fats, so your omega-3. And that's, that is for its role also um, in inflammation. Yes. So specifically for asthma, those would probably be my top two. Um, bearing in mind also zinc is important for your immune system and vitamin um, A is important for the lining of your lungs. So I think each condition really has a few nutrients that I like to consider, but that always needs to be in the big picture of a healthy diet. So. Well, yeah. isn't, isn't that, I mean, I mean, you've picked two there to kick off with, which is vitamin D, and I go down to the beach locally, and you probably do yeah. too, and you see how carefully people are wrapping their children up <laughs> and protecting them from this terrible thing called the sun, which I, which is, I think, still the best source of vitamin D, isn't it? 100% it is the best source, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and you're gone. So, and, I, and I was just going to pick up with what you were saying. I totally agree. I mean, it's the slip, slap, slop campaign, you know, in Australia. And I have no doubt that it's helped with skin cancer, but um, certainly a lot of children that I see in my rooms are vitamin D deficient. Mm. And the second one, of course, is another beauty when it comes to uh, public health messages, and that's healthy fats. I mean, fats are bad, aren't they? Uh, we should all be on low <laughs> fat or... I mean, I'm being facetious, obviously. But, I know you are. But, but, I know but, you are, which is but, why I'm chuckling. <laughs> yeah, but um, that's another problem, isn't it? It is. Um, and I think that we need to get the message out there to parents that, you know, healthy fats are good fats and um, we shouldn't ever be giving our food low fat. I'm sorry, our children low fat food. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's the full cream milk. It's you know, it's the real butter, it's having, you know, real meats, it's, you know, cooking in butter or lard, it's, it's using olive oil, you know, so it's some beautiful, beautiful fats in your food. Yep. You know, this is what I find so interesting about talking about children's health, because even for those listeners that may not have children, kids are the canaries in the coal mine, aren't they? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. I mean, what you're seeing in your practice is what's going to happen, well, they're the adults of tomorrow, and they're possibly the mm -hmm. adults of today. Yeah, and uh, and if you look at um, you know on that you know line of thought, it, some people have speculated that children of today will live shorter lives than we will. You wow. know, so my two girls will die younger than me, oh, wow. which yeah. you know, as a pediatrician and a mum, is absolutely frightening and upsetting. You know, so we absolutely need to look at the state of you know in the environment and the state of our children and their health and take steps now to prevent that from happening. Now, before we move on from off from nutrition, I, I think one of the things that challenges a lot of people, um, a lot of uh, children, is, is being a fussy eater. Mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what do you say yeah. to parents whose kids say, look, I just can't get, I, there's just, they won't eat anything other than mashed potato or whatever. I mean, you know, like, or Vegemite sandwich. What, what do you say to those parents? Yeah, Ron, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, research done, and certainly research done by Blackmores has shown that over 50% of um, parents in Australia are concerned their children are fussy eaters. And 85% um, of those children aren't eating their vegetables. So, you know, absolutely it is that my child, you know, only wants to eat white food is usually the complaint that I get, and that's exactly what you've just described. Um, look, bearing in mind there's often a reason behind why children develop fussy eating. I think that I certainly have a few, you know, general top tips that I give to parents, and um, the first one is for parents to empower themselves. So that's for parents to understand what their child is eating and what they should be eating. So what does a serving size look like? What does an actual portion look like? How many should they be having a day? And um, what is healthy food? And with that information, then being able to plan ahead for their week so that their food is prepped, so that their vegetables are prepped, which makes it a lot easier to make healthy food choices and not be tempted to get takeout on the way home from work, you know, after picking your children up from school. Um, the next point is to involve children. So obviously age dependent, anything from shopping to ideally growing a little vegetable patch in your backyard, 
you know, giving them to help in the kitchen, giving them some degree of choice as well, which children love, um, but giving them the healthy choices. You know, do you want your broccoli or your zucchini with dinner tonight, for example? Um, and then, you know, exactly. So, you know, getting them involved so they, they feel like they do have that sense of control. And any, you know, any parent of a toddler knows it's all of our control. Um, mm -hmm. My third tip would be for parents to set a good example. So, and, and also to make it fun. So by setting a good example, you know, children learn by mimicking. And, um, and if you can sit down with your children and make mealtime an enjoyable family relaxed time where you're eating and enjoying each other's company, you'll be surprised at how much better your child will do with eating and how much better they'll do with trying new foods if they see you, mummy or daddy, you know, putting the food in your mouth and, and chewing it and enjoying it. So um, I really think that that's an important message to get across, you know, and, and I mentioned making it fun. So, you know, make a little bit of a game about it, you know, so, you know and you can also use it as a learning experience. You know, show me everything that's green, show me what's red. And you know, that also feeds into the whole rainbow of foods, which you can also talk about. But, um, you know, I guess setting an example and making it fun. And um, my last tip is don't give up. <laughs> you know, it's very discouraging. Um, you know, as I mentioned a few times, I've got toddlers and sometimes, you know, you can prepare the most beautiful meal and they'll just throw it on the floor. Mm -hmm. And it happens to all of us. And um, the message behind that is just keep going. Try not to get stressed. Reward any positive um, steps in the right direction. So if a child even just sniffs the food, that's a good thing. Um, but keep going because it can take around about 10, sometimes even 20 times um, for a child to accept a new food. Wow, that's that's they're, they're brilliant tips, and that's a great thing to finish on because, you know, in this in this section here, because ten to twenty times, you know, I mean, we we need to manage our expectations too, don't we? Absolutely, yeah, and yeah. try yeah try, try and take the stress away from it. Yeah, okay. Look, there, there's some terrific tips in the in the plate, and and the play. Go on, tell us a bit about play. What we should be doing? What they should be doing? Probably what we should do. <laughs> Well, exactly. I, I think that's, that's the thing, isn't it? It's, it's lifestyle choices. But um, play, children children learn through play and um, they develop through their play. So it's really about encouraging that, getting them outdoors especially. There's a lot of research done looking at um, children playing in the dirt um, in terms of their gut microbiome, in terms of their immunity, in terms of their health, um, but also their vitamin D, which you've touched on. So um, it's encouraging children to get outdoors, to, um, you know, stretch their little bodies and have some fun with it and, um, and to play, not to be sitting inside looking at screens, looking at TVs, you know, literature showing TV hours with, um, with obesity is, is very well known. Um, and also, you know, there's been a lot of media recently about um, the emotional impact of computer gaming or screen time and iPads on, on children and adolescents. So that, that really is what, um, what the play is about. Yeah, yeah that's a, that must be a, just a huge challenge. I know we spoke um, a few um, episodes ago to Jodie Lowinger about anxiety. Yes, I know and, Jody. Yeah. Yes, and she was talking about, I, I was shocked to hear that young people under the age of 18 were getting diagnosis of anxiety and depression, like one in four. And, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. this, this was just a shocking. Is that obviously what you must be seeing in your clinic? Yes, yes. I mean, absolutely in the older children, thankfully not so much in the younger children in my practice. But, um, yes, 100%. And the social, social isolation that they feel too with the screen time, you know, which brings us into the next one of the other P's to yeah. people. But, um you know, I think that parents need to limit it. You know, I understand there are times when it's inevitable you kind of need, not need to, but it makes life a little bit easier. And by all means, you know, I'm not being militant about it, but just be aware of it and absolutely limit that screen time. Mm. Because you did make reference to the importance of relationships, and that's a very famous and long-running Harvard study, isn't it, really? That, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's been going for 75 years and telling us, relationships were the best predictors of longevity and health and wellness. Absolutely, yes. And, and, and there's also, I think there's a new book out on that at the moment too, looking at um, all the populations in the world who have the oldest and healthiest um, living people. Um, I think it's called The Blue Zones, and yeah. um, that also touches quite a lot on that. 
And and technology, obviously, not just playing games, but the effect of social media um, can be really challenging. Is that what you Oh, mean? very, very much so. Mm. And again, much more so in your, you know, your older children, your school age children. Um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Tinder, and all these other funny things that I don't really understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, I don't believe that our children need to be on social media. Um, and if they are, it should be supervised. Yes, which leads us to the last one, which is protect. Yes, yeah, so um, protect is, again, as I said, there, there's, there are a few aspects too, but mainly we're looking at your environment, so the mm. environment that you're in and, and um, what toxins you're being exposed to. And um, I guess my, you know, my big interest with children is all the endocrine disruptors. And what, what we feel is safe today is probably going to be proven to be unsafe tomorrow. Um, you know, if you look at the amount of chemicals that we have in the world, you know, hundreds of thousands of chemicals and how few have actually been safety tested. They just released to use, you know, to be used in industry. And there's only like an after fact that they, um, they get pulled up when um, problems are then being detected. And I think, you know, the most common ones are going to be your BPA that everyone you know, used to think was fine, and now we suddenly realise that it's actually not so fine. And um, you know, now we're buying everything BPA free. But I guess my question, well, you know, is well, what are they using instead? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, so it's it's really being aware of of what is in your environment and also what's within your control. There's certain things that we are unable to control. You know, we're not living in a mountain somewhere remote. We're living in cities, um, but certainly within your own home. You can, um, you know, use non-toxic cleaners. You know, if, if you look at, you, you, you get, you know, those um, spray wipes or, or those, you know, regular coals and woolies wipes that you get to wipe down tables. You know, they've actually shown that it's in our food. You know, so just be aware that whatever you're cleaning with, if you're not happy to eat it, you probably shouldn't be cleaning with it. Yes, what a statement. What is the, um, <laughs> what is true? I heard that, I actually heard yeah. that too. What are what some of the things that if, you know, parents hear this term, we all hear this term, endocrine disrupting chemicals, how does that, how does that affect manifest itself in your, you know, to a child? How would you know if your child was being affected in some way by endocrine disrupting chemicals? Well, look, it's, it's, it's actually quite difficult to prove, um, but it can happen from the time when they're born. So you get children born with what's called ambiguous genitalia or abnormal genitalia. So, you know, the one that's that's postulated to be linked to it is something called hyperspadius, which is um, where the penis, where the opening, where the wee comes out, the urethra, um, where that is in the abnormal position. So that's believed to be due to um, endocrine disruptors. The, the rise in it, not not you know not, not every single case, but the increasing race, the increasing um, incidence of it. Um, the other, I guess, big group would be children who are going into puberty much earlier than what we'd expect. You know, so. Often the age of puberty, so um, is is de- dependent on you know when your mum went you know had a period or you know when dad went into puberty. So it often runs in families. But you know I've certainly seen many children in my clinic where um, it's a case of well you know actually you know mum only started puberty when she was thirteen, but you know. Sophie's presenting when she's nine, you know, and um, and I guess those would be the most common clinical um, consequences of of endocrine disruptors that I see. But um, there are many, many, many more consequences out there, mm. and then we still discover it. Right. Oh wow, this is this has been fantastic. Listen, um, what I, I just quickly wanted to touch on a very, very subject. It's a tough subject, I know, but the vaccinations, and I'm just intrigued to know why is there such a controversy. What what is the controversy? Can you just share with our listener why it's a controversy? I think I think it's a very tough question. I think that um, it's a controversy because anything that can potentially impact your immune system can potentially impact your health. I think that's perhaps a simple way of looking at it and um, also the issue of well what is in those vaccines and are we introducing toxins directly into our children's um, bodies so hmm. I think there are a few parts to it um, and then you know there was that that big study um, in in England where they you know where Andrew Wakefield linked 
um, sorry, um, the NMR vaccine to autism, you know, which has su- subsequently been disproven. So I think that there's a lot of media out there and um, why why we've only focused on vaccines, I'm not sure, because I don't think that it's only vaccines that could potentially be to blame. I think that it's a combination of factors. Um but I, I think it's a really tricky. I think it's a tricky one that you've asked me there, right? Yeah, sorry, no, but it's it's a good point. No, it's, okay. it's a good point yeah. that uh, you know why it's been such a a focus because there are literally tens of thousands of chemicals, and you've mentioned the endocrine disruptors as well as a as yeah. a. As a as issues, and this is part of taking a holistic view of it. Listen, um, what if what are a few just uh, if you were giving patient parents, uh, oh, but, you know, uh, some tips to ensure their child enjoys good health? Well, I guess the five P's are the way to go, aren't they? Is that would that be your <laughs> focus on those? Yes, absolutely, and I think also um, one that we could probably add into it um, is preconception. So another P for you, right? Right. <laughs> um, okay. So it's it's mum making sure that their health is optimal before they're full pregnant. Not always possible, but um, I think that that would be the ideal condition. So making sure that mum is, in terms of both her environment as well as her personal health and especially her nutrition, um, that she really, really um, optimizes that before trying to fall pregnant and then maintaining it through the pregnancy. Because, and again, I'm sure it's a statistic that maybe you're aware of, but um, you know, we used to think that babies are in this 100% sterile environment within mum's tummy, but we now know that that's totally wrong. And, you know, they've done cord blood testing and they've shown that, you know, there are hundreds of chemicals um, within the newborn baby's bloodstream. So, you know, and that's coming through mum's exposure. And I, I don't want to guilt mums out because, you know, being a parent is, is a tough gig. But, um, you know, perhaps if, if mums are aware of it, they can take simple steps to you know, clean up their environment before they fall pregnant. I meant to ask you about sleep. Yes. Because that yes. Was, that's a big one. What, yes. you know, what are you seeing out there? Kids are not getting enough of it? Technology interrupting with it? or what, What's happening? It depends on the age. So um, if I'm seeing young children, it's often that um, they don't know how to go to sleep or they haven't been given the right environment to go to sleep. So it's a lot about sleep hygiene, age dependent. Um, and then with, when you start to hit into your toddlers, it's about being overstimulated and being fed the wrong foods. Um, and again, not being taught the proper routine. So, and then as they get older, again, it's more screen time. So it really is a little bit dependent on what age they are. Um, and also looking at what parents do around sleep and, you know, whether they co-sleep and things like that. So I, I think it's it's quite variable depending on the age. I remember when um, my daughter was born, and now that's 32 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> See, you thought you were in practice for a long time. Um, <laughs> and uh, the paediatrician at the time said to us, and this, my wife was pregnant and we were, were expecting the first child, and she said, the thing you must do in the first year of life is teach your child to sleep. Mm-hmm. And we ignored that advice, and on on <laughs> reflection, on we didn't on yeah. our we didn't on our second child, but we on yeah. reflection, I think that was the best piece of advice a doctor has ever given me. Yeah, how do you? Because it's good for everyone's health. Right? Everyone's health. So yeah. so you take a baby home from from hospital. How do yeah. you get them into a good sleep routine? <laughs> I think that yeah. <laughs> Um, look, there's some babies who are going to have difficulties with sleep because of medical reasons, right? So you've got to take out that bunch of kids. And those are the ones I'm talking about who maybe have got bad reflux or something like that. Or, um, you know, cows more protein intolerance or something that's causing them to be in pain, which then, um, you know, keeps them up. So if you look at your other group, I think it's addressing their primary needs. So making sure that they're well fed, they're comfortable, so their nappy's done, they're in a good, you know, they're in a comfortable sleeping space. Um, And then it's being able to pick up on their cues. So it's about, and I'm going to say mum, but obviously dads will, you know, it's interesting. No, no, let's be, let's let's share it around here. Let's not, let's not. Yeah, um, exactly. But I'm just saying for the ease of my communication, I'll just say mum, but it's definitely everyone. Um, It's about, you know, you've got to, Babies and, and um, parents have to get to know each other, you know, and there's a period of that, absolutely. Um, and so it's about learning your baby's cues and um, how best to react to them. So 
every baby is a little bit different and every baby enjoys um, different things. So, you know, I'll just give my personal experience. My one baby, you know, loved to have her own space to sleep. And I thought that she wanted to be cuddled and she absolutely hated it. My second baby, you know, loves to be cuddled. So, it's, you know, you do have to go through a little bit of process of, of learning. Then, look, I advocate... Um, routine but there's certainly different camps and I think it's important also to establish what kind of parenting that parents prefer do they want attachment parenting where the child is going to co-sleep with them and they're going to baby carry um you know or do they have you know another child learn another school-aged child where they need you know to be able to put the child down to sleep so I, I think it's important to establish exactly what expectations are and that being said you know, at least for, you know, what's called the fourth trimester, sort of the first few months, first three months of life, it's very important for a child to have a lot of skin-to-skin -skin contact and for, to be very close to mum and to, you know, to be settled and calm that way. Um, but, you know, and, and, then, and then after that period, you can start having, if that's what you want, time when um, they're learning to sleep on their own. I don't believe you can properly sleep train a baby as such, um, and I certainly don't ever advocate leaving a baby to scream until they're distressed. But... Um, but, you know, we do have to teach our babies and that's, um, you know, that's giving them sleep associations, letting them, you know, have, you know, whatever their sleeping bag is, whatever, and things like that. So um, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, right, brilliant. I think Brilliantly. I think that's fabulous, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, when you when you take a baby home, um, I mean, we've just had a granddaughter, so I know this has gone on and, and you know, you hold the baby and the baby settles and sleeps, and then you slowly put yeah. the baby down. But uh, you know, when, yeah. you're, when you're three or four, out the room. <laughs> that's right. When you're three or four months down the track, that baby starts to get a bit heavier, and and, yeah. and if they've only settled on you, it becomes a real challenge. So there's a 100%. point at, there's yeah. a point at which self settling and finding that balance, and then when you've got older kids, of course, that changes. It's a, it's a little bit easier with the first one, or. In, in many ways. Yeah, because you don't have all those other time constraints. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Listen, taking a step back from your position as a paediatrician, and because mm -hmm. we're all on this journey in, through our own lives, what do you think the biggest challenge is for people on their health journey through life in our modern world? Um, I think time. I think we're all very pressed for time. Um, is a big one. So people look for convenience and um, everyone's always rushing around. And I think that that creates an environment where you're making not the best choices, both lifestyle and food. So, you know, I, I gave the example earlier of, you know, rushing home from work. So you're stressed, <laughs> you're battling the traffic. So perhaps you're being exposed to all those toxins, you know, you're rushing to pick your child up. You're not having the time to connect with them. So that's your people. Um, you are then rushing home to try and get something to eat. You realize that you haven't, you know, bought food properly because you've been time poor. So you end up getting takeout, which then doesn't give you the correct nutrient density that you need. You then put the kids to bed, um, you, you then catch up with your work, so you end up getting to bed much later because you've also been on your screen, so that you then create insomnia, so then you don't get your rest that you need, and then the, the cycle just continues. So I think that it's, a lot of it's got to do with being um, being pushed and being time poor. Deb, thank you so much for joining us today. That was just fantastic. It's a pleasure, Ron. Happy to be here and happy to come back if you'd ever like me to. That point about sleep, teaching your children to sleep. As I said, we totally ignored that advice 32 years ago when our oldest daughter was born. But on reflection, it's still one of the best pieces of advice any health practitioner could ever give. And that is take sleep seriously. It's a good example of what we all have to learn from the challenges of children's health. And tell me if the five P's aren't as relevant to you, whatever your age, as the children Deb focuses on. Plate, the first P, nutrition. Play, uh, lifestyle, moving, exercise. Pause, building downtime and relaxation into your day. People, meaning relationships, face-to-face -face relationships, the best predictor of longevity, health and wellness. A Harvard study that has been going for 75 years. Amazing. Protect, 
That's about environmental issues and toxins. She mentioned endocrine disruptors, and they affect adults as well as children. And that's just scratching the surface of these environmental issues we're all facing. Go back and have a listen to the episodes we did with Professor Mark Cohen or Nicole Bilgema or Lynn McLean. And of course, the one we did with Alex Stewart as well. Deb's sixth P was preconception, health. And while she mentioned women, regular listeners to this program will know that actually also applies to men as well, as we learnt from those episodes with Leah Hechtman and Elizabeth Mucci. Look, we're going to have links to Dr. Deb Levy's website. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast.